Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm joined at the podium by the Minister for Health and Social Care and online by our Director of Public Health. In recent days, case numbers of COVID-19 on the island have continued to increase, crossing the 1,000 threshold. Now, I completely understand that many in our community to continue to view case numbers as the barometer for how our island is faring in the face of the pandemic. But with our vaccination programme nearing completion, we must shift our focus as a community and as a nation away from case numbers and onto hospital admissions and capacity. That is where my focus lies, as it does for the Council of Ministers. I fully appreciate this change in mindset will take time. After doing all we have done to keep the virus from our shores for so many months, including three lockdowns, it is jarring to see the virus spreading with no restrictions in place. After all we've been through together in the past year and a half, this shift from eliminating the virus to putting in place mitigations and learning to live with it was never going to be easy. And yes, we must be honest, of course there is still the possibility that we may need to have to take steps to address the spread of the virus if the pressure on our health service becomes too severe. I hope our vaccination programme means such a step will not be necessary, but we cannot and must not rule us out, and we must never say never. But any response would be focusing on protecting hospital capacity and ensuring there is space for those with COVID-19 who need intervention and specialist care. It would not be about locking down society and preventing people from getting on with their lives. We must place the situ situation we are in today in context. Almost 90% of those eligible for COVID-19 vaccines have received at least one dose and the number of people who have received their second dose grows each and every day. As at Tuesday this week, over 77% of those eligible for a COVID-19 vaccine had received both doses, a number which increases with every passing day. And we hope that by the 31st of August, all eligible adults on the island will have been offered the opportunity for their second dose. Being vaccinated does not completely shield us from catching COVID. We have always been clear about that. But it does increase the chances that any resulting illness will be less severe, reducing the number of people requiring hospital care and the number of deaths. Vaccinated people with the virus are also much less likely to spread it to others. Our vaccination programme helps to break the link between having the virus and ending up in hospital because of it. In the days ahead, we will see more people being admitted to hospital because of COVID. But let us compare our position now to just four months ago. In the middle of March, we had over 850 active COVID cases, with 23 people in hospital because of the virus. Today, we have well over double that number in active cases, and the number of people in hospital is five. There can be no doubt that the vaccine is working as expected and is saving lives. And whilst it does not offer us complete protection, no vaccine does, it does give us the means to be able to live with COVID-19 in precisely the same way we have adapted to live with other diseases and illnesses. We will move from living in a world where COVID-19 represents a pandemic to one where COVID-19 is endemic. As I've said, this mind shift will take time, but vaccination has changed the nature of the game in our favour. David, I know there are a few items you wish to discuss and you may wish to pick up on some of the points I've mentioned. David. Thank you very much, Chief Minister. We've got to start off really with a bit of a sad note, and it is sad that I'm having to say this again. But at the weekend, Manx Care had to speak with the police after members of the swabbing team at the grandstand were abused while trying to do their jobs. This is not acceptable. Neither is sitting and beeping the car, ho uh, car horn repeatedly at staff while you're waiting because you're unhappy at having to queue. This is actually very distracting for the staff, and some have even found it intimidating. I've also heard numerous reports of people being rude and abusive to community pharmacy staff while trying to get lateral flow devices when they've run, run out. I have also today been told about an assault on a community health care worker over LFT testing kits. 
These people are only doing their jobs and deserve to be praised for the work they are doing, not subject to abuse. And just in the last few hours, I've also been told of an incident at the grandstand where a member of the swabbing team was verbally abused. Luckily, a patrolling police officer witnessed this and intervened. This is completely unacceptable and won't be tolerated. Police are now going to be regularly patrolling the grandstand and, as we've seen today, won't hesitate to take action if they need to. Please also respect the work that our health and social care colleagues are doing in the facilities across the rest of the island. They're working long hours and in very challenging conditions, particularly this week given the heatwave we're experiencing. They deserve our support, not criticism. Please remember they also see a lot of criticism across social media. They're members of our community too, and it's upsetting for them to read when they are doing the best job they can for you and our island. Many of you will also have seen that Manx Care has reintroduced visitor restrictions at some locations, including Nobles Hospital, and that staff are once again wearing PPE across all of the island's health and social care settings. This is not a contradiction to living with COVID. Instead, this is Manx Care's response towards being able to live with and adapt to a world with COVID in it. We have to take proportionate steps to protect the most vulnerable and sick patients and minimise opportunities for the spread of hospital-acquired infection. The decisions being taken are in line with guidance from our infection and prevention control team. And on that note, I'd like to bring our Director of Public Health in to explain a bit more. Henrietta. Thank you, Minister. Yes, as you say, Manx Care has a dedicated infection prevention and control team, and they lead the response to COVID in health and care settings, just as they lead the response to any communicable disease incident. Um, obviously, in terms of um, the nursing home where there were cases earlier in the week, part of the initial response was to close to visitors. And I understand that that has caused some concern amongst um, relatives, friends and the wider public who are concerned as to how people who have been fully vaccinated, two plus two vaccinated, can still either be infected or be at risk of infection. Um, so I wanted to pick up particularly on that um, and to say that we do expect to see cases of COVID in people who have been fully vaccinated because while the vaccines are highly effective at preventing symptomatic illness, hospital admission and death, they are not perfect. So being fully vaccinated confers around 95% protection from hospital admission and death, but the risk of serious illness and death is also very closely linked to age, and that increased risk as you get older remains even after vaccination, although it is reduced to around a 20th of what it would be if you weren't vaccinated. So that means that a person who is 80 and fully vaccinated has reduced their risk to that of an unvaccinated person aged 50. So that's a significant reduction, but it doesn't take the risk to zero. And so we will expect to see cases and unfortunately serious illness and death, even in people who have been fully or partly vaccinated. Vaccination is the most important tool we have against COVID-19, but we also need to continue thinking about taking all the other actions we know reduce transmission. So that's thinking about hand space, space and fresh air, thinking about using a face covering if you're in an enclosed space with people you don't usually meet, for example, shopping or on public transport. And if you develop symptoms, stay home and get tested. We're moving to a world in which, you know, COVID is going to be part of our lives. It's going to be endemic. So we need to make these actions part of our regular routine too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henrietta. And I think some very good messages there, particularly, again, reinforcing the hands face space. It is important that people consider when they are in enclosed spaces, whether they believe it's appropriate to wear a mask. Um, certainly, if the ventilation in that place is not very good, then you know, personally, I would suggest that masks should be worn. And it's great to hear those messages repeated again, because we can't repeat them enough. People need to consider mask wearing when in enclosed spaces and also the ventilation um, of the place that they are in. I'd like to round off, Chief Minister, with just some bits on the vaccination programme. 
There's another opportunity to gain protection from COVID-19 via the vaccine as we move towards the end of our current vaccination rollout. Walk-in vaccination appointments are going to be available next week for those aged over 18 on Tuesday the 27th and Wednesday the 28th of July. Those are from 9am to noon at Chester Street and you can drop in for first doses only of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. This is not for people awaiting their second dose but for anyone who hasn't yet had any dose. So it's a last call catch up almost. No booking necessary, but only limited doses are available. Anyone who is attending should read the information on the vaccine on the government website. Also, turning to second doses, there have been some concerns from people who have missed their second dose appointments due to testing positive. After an individual tests positive for COVID-19, they should wait 28 days before receiving the vaccine. Our vaccination team are aware of all those who have missed their appointments and are working on putting on additional appointment dates towards the end of August to accommodate those people. Thank you, Chief Minister. Thank you, David. Now, I think Dr Ewart has already alluded to this, but I might like a little bit more information. Now, our vaccination programme focused first and foremost on the most vulnerable in our community, which included older people as they are more susceptible to the virus. And yesterday, as we've just mentioned, we received word that COVID had made its way to the Riartner Bay residential home. Manx Care has put in place restrictions to protect residents, and I don't know if Dr Ewart has anything more to say on that topic. Thank you, Chief Minister. I think I, I inadvertently covered that probably earlier than I should have done, um, somewhat out of an order. So really just to reiterate what, what I said before, slightly out of context, in that um, the response to this, um, these cases is being led by the Infection Prevention and Control Team, um, who have the expertise to do that and respond to all communicable disease incidents in health and care settings. OK, I know it'll be disappointing for family members that they can't visit loved ones for a period of time, but at the end of the day, we are concerned that we need to ensure the protection of the residents of our um, residential homes. OK, right. Now, learning to live with the virus, thanks to the protection offered by our vaccination programme, means we are continuing to explore how we can gradually remove restrictions at our borders and the measures we have in place to mitigate the spread of the virus. It is still our intention to return to unrestricted travel between the Isle of Man and the rest of the British Isles in line with the COVID-19 exit framework. Now, we had hoped the next step on that journey would have been this Saturday. We had tabled changes at Timwell that proposed opening up travel from countries on England's green and amber lists, exempting children aged 11 and under from testing and isolation, recognising additional vaccines that have received regulatory approval, which would have opened up unrestricted travel for the island, for the Isle of Man, for many people in Ireland, and removing exit tests for those who are in isolation because of the virus. Regrettably, Timbal voted not to allow standing orders to be suspended so that the supplementary order paper that contained these regulations could be taken. Clearly, Council of Ministers felt these changes were important to consider, as did the majority of Timbal members, and it is disappointing a minority did not feel Timbal should even discuss them today. I have not yet had the opportunity to discuss with the Council of Ministers as to what this means on the changes we were proposing, and will do so later this evening. For now, it means the regulations will not be voted on, and none of the changes will come into effect on Saturday, as we had hoped. Let's take some questions. And first we have Alex Wotton from BBC Isle of Man. Good afternoon, Alex. Pastor Mai. Good afternoon. Um, just on the Rietna Bay residential home, I wonder if you could just clarify um, whether it is staff or residents or both who have tested positive and how many cases you're aware of. Right, I'm not aware of that detail. Maybe, David, you might yeah, be able to I, share I had light. an update yesterday, Alex, but I'll bring the Director of Public Health in in case she has wider knowledge than I do. Um, but certainly the update I had yesterday was that it was two residents um, that had tested positive. But I'll bring the doctor, Dr Ewart in just in case she's got any... Yeah, no, that, that's my understanding as well, Minister. OK, thank you. Um, on the second question, actually, on lateral flow device kits, um, you said to date there have been 40,000 picked up and you're bringing in a further 120,000, so 160,000 altogether. How much does this cost government or is it part of an agreement with the UK? 
No, it's something that we, we have to pay. I think off the top of my head, it's costing about £2.75 um, per test. But I think it's been a great success. The, the people of the Isle of Man have really um, wanted these lateral flow tests, and it, it, it is helping us move forward. I don't know, David, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, the figure's absolutely correct, Chief Minister. It is £2.75 per test. Um, in relation to this, actually, in many ways, this is, this is a good thing. It shows that, again, as a close-knit community, we are very responsible, and people have been going out of their way to try and get the, ki the kits to test themselves, um, and thereby protecting our community as a whole. So, actually, I'm exceptionally encouraged by the level of take-up that there's actually been of lateral flows. So, while, yes, there is a cost associated with this, I actually think it's a very worthwhile cost, and as we come to live with COVID, we need to actually have that ability for people to be able to test without having to go through the formalities of going up to the grandstand for a PCR. So this is the next stage as a part of a mitigation out in the community. And the fact that the take-up has been that phenomenal that we've gone through 40,000 already, I think actually shows how well our community has responded to wanting to take part and wanting to test. Thank you Just very a very quick, sorry, uh, calculation of £440,000. Does that sound about right? Uh, your maths is a lot better than me, Alex. Um, I'd be getting the calculator out right now. It was uh, a calculator. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm at health and not the Treasury. OK, right, thanks thank very much, Alex. Next, we move on to um, Ariane Barrera at 3FM. Good afternoon, Ariane. Fast am I. Um, is for Health Minister. Um, oh, good afternoon. My, my first question is for the Health Minister. Um, I understand, um, Mr. Ashford, you've shifted your focus from case numbers, and I also understand your focus being on hospital capacity now. But what are you doing to ensure general practice can carry out core medical services, general services, since the massive surge in COVID positive cases that require double or triple the time? So in terms of the COVID positive cases, obviously they are isolated unless there is actually something wrong medically. Um, in terms of the general medical practice, the GPs have protocols that have been in place since the start of this pandemic. They use a mixture of phone consultations um, to, keep, to keep things turning over. Um, there is, let's be perfectly honest, there is going to be an impact and a level while the case numbers continue to rise. But we have got protocols in place to keep um, things turning over. I know there was recent comment about the fact that Manx Care had to suspend elective surgery. I need to absolutely stress that is nothing to do with COVID. That was actually to do with general admissions around the hospital and um, that we activated the winter plan um, issues there to bring to bring that into line. It wasn't to do with COVID cases being admitted. That would have happened with COVID or not because of the level of general admissions to the hospital. So I just need to make that absolutely clear because there seemed to be a bit of confusion out there the other night the suspension of the elective surgery had nothing to do with COVID. Uh, are you aware of any issues in the GP surgeries at all? So the GP surgeries are under pressure, but the pressure that they are under as well is they are seeing a lot of general illness cases. Um, our GPs work fantastically hard, um, and I know it has been stressful for people in some areas to manage to get appointments with the GPs. But yes, they are under pressure, um, and that's one of the reasons we'll be looking to see what support we can give to the primary care network going forward. But that is just general medical pressures as well. It's not necessarily, again, COVID-related. OK, thank you. Um, my second question is for the Chief Minister. In the light of the recent statement from the Isle of Man Chamber of Commerce saying that um, some local businesses stuck in a cycle of customer cancellations, staff shortages and debt. Are there any plans to review the Treasury support for local business? Well, I know the Treasury Minister met with the Economic Group Recovery Group today at lunchtime and he will be making uh, a number of announcements as to changes to help people who um, are having to go off ill and, and take a, a cut in income, and he will be looking at um, any additional support that he might be able to give to um, businesses, but that's really something he will be announcing shortly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we move on to Paul Moulton of Alaman Television. Good afternoon, Paul. Fast am I. Good afternoon. Uh, Dr Hewitt, you weren't here at the last press conference, and I asked a question, and I did want to hear it from you yourself. Are you fully on board with these decisions being made by Comin? As don't forget, obviously, and everyone is aware that you are putting in the medical information to this. Are you completely 100% comfortable with the way we're going? 
I don't make the decisions, so it's not my role to either support or oppose the decisions properly taken by Comen. Um, as you said yourself just then, my role is to make sure they're apprised of all the current evidence and intelligence and data on COVID, and then they take that into account. They also have to balance the wider economic and social impacts. So, so long as the decision is properly taken by due process, I will work with that as a public servant. My question was, are you 100% on side, therefore, with what is going on? Because your, your, your input is, is, in, is valuable to everyone to hear what you think, not what Coleman think. What do you think? Are you on side? This is a very difficult time to be making decisions and there are pros and cons to both sides of the argument, as we've seen played out in the press across and also in discussion here. There is no right or wrong. None of us has a crystal ball. We can only feel our way based on the information we have and responding as things play out. So to that extent, it's a properly taken decision and I work with that as a public servant. Oh, you're comfortable with the decisions being made, are you? The decisions have been made in accordance with due process, as is perfectly right and proper. And as a public servant, I support and I will support in the delivery of those policies. Um, my next question, basically, uh, what we're missing from this briefing today was the word herding. And, you know, this has been going on since we started these press briefings. Um, herd immunity. Is this now particularly what we are doing Albeit, but you're not actually saying it by name now. I don't know who wants to take that one. No, it's certainly not, Paul, but I'll, I'll let the health minister um, expand on that. Yeah, I'll bring the Director of Public Health in in a moment, but I'll express my personal views, and these are just my personal views, Paul, so I'd want to get that on the record first. Most certainly not. We have never gone down the route of herd immunity. I think in the early days, the pandemic, I think I stood at one of these podiums. It was in a different room then. It was when we had the old wooden podium, I think, and I actually made clear that I didn't think herd immunity was a route to go down because it's a wonderful scientific theory, but there's continuous debates about what level do you have to get to to actually achieve it. And as far as I'm aware, I don't think in practice it's ever actually been properly assessed and achieved before. It's a great scientific theory, but it's not something government should be attaining to. We most certainly are not attaining to that. I know there's, it's been the talk of social media, and there's a lot of anxious people out there with the case numbers, and that's actually very, very understandable, because it's very different to the approach the island's taken previously. Um, but as we come to live with COVID, and you know, it is a sad fact that it's not going anywhere. It does have to shift to around hospitalisation. And the Chief Minister laid out something very important before that is very different to the approach being taken in the UK. Although they are changing the approach now, a bit now. Previously, it's been said with the UK, it is only ever a one-way street. They previously said that this was a one-way roadmap, um, no going back. We've never said that. And we've deliberately never said that because we still have measures in place around hospitalisation, around pressures on the health service. And if we actually see that, then we may have to consider other measures. Um, so we haven't said it's a one way street. What we've done is shift our focus to treat COVID like we do a lot of other diseases where it's the outcomes that matter and whether the health service is actually under pressure or not. Thanks and Dr Hewitt, do you want to add to that? Sorry. Oh, sorry. And uh, yes, I'll bring yes. Dr Hewitt in. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I mean, little to add to that, really, other than to say that our chief defence against COVID is not trying to achieve herd immunity. It's vaccination programme and then supporting that with all the actions that we can take around hand space, space, fresh air and making sure we report symptoms and get tested. You know, the, those are the, the tools in our toolbox, if you like, for COVID. It may be said you're doing it inadvertently then, because that's exactly what is happening. People are catching this and uh, getting over it and not going to hospital necessarily. But those people will have the antibodies. Therefore, herd immunity will potentially well, be reached. But it doesn't well, last forever, Paul, yeah. does it? Herd immunity. You know, if you have I've, I've had COVID, uh, you only have the um, antibodies in your body for a matter of months. So, you know, herd, if herd immunity would be if you had it for the rest of your life. You know, you, you can catch it again. I don't know. David, and the vaccines don't last forever because we're talking about boosters already. So, you know. Well, well we need to be careful with the vaccines. We don't actually know. The scientific studies still going on around that. The booster programme is a precaution because the recent studies have shown that if you get a booster delivered six months after you've had your second dose, then it actually increases 
um, the actual level. So we don't actually know around the vaccines at the moment how long any antibody reaction lasts. But certainly, as the chief minister's just said, you know, again, one of the reasons I think I've stated before at this podium that personally, I've never favoured the herd immunity idea is to me herd immunity only works if it's a permanent barrier against infection. And we know with COVID, it certainly isn't. One of my friends in the UK has had COVID four times now since the pandemic started. In one, um, so they've tested positive and they know it's been separate infections. So it's certainly, I've never seen herd immunity as a, as a starter, really. Thanks very Thank much, Paul. Now we move on to Rob Pritchard from Manx Radio. Good afternoon, Rob. Fast am I. Fast am I, Chief Minister. The stark reality over the past couple of weeks has been a couple of things for residents if you take a look at it, hundreds of workers have been forced into isolation with pretty much no financial support and businesses have been forced to shut. The daily case figures have been both inaccurate and confusing for residents. And we've even seen the vaccine dashboard or sorry, the COVID-19 cases dashboard go down earlier today. Nobles Hospital and I know Minister Ashford there, you clarified that this wasn't due to COVID, but it has been suspending operations because of the pressures it's under. We've seen cases increase in children, the majority of whom are unvaccinated. And up until now, we've had what seem to be inadequate supplies of lateral flow devices. Many people can't get their hands on them. They've been selling out too quickly. Do you accept that this latest approach so far by government has been a failure? Um, no, I don't. Yes, um, the lateral flow test did, did, well, they didn't sell out. We're giving them away, and that's probably the problem. There are, see, the, it's there been a massive success, and um, 40,000 um, have been handed out. So um, we've got a considerable amount more, which we will have with people shortly. I understand people's frustrations with that, but unfortunately we had a big delay in customs and excise, which we weren't expecting, and we weren't expecting them to be so popular with the public, but obviously they have been. That's a success. You've already answered one part of the question that the hospital is uh, going restricted because it's got increasing numbers of, of normal health issues. The health minister has already said nothing whatsoever to do with, with the COVID. We've got five people in hospital at the moment, and whilst that's five too many, if I've said already if you compare that with the previous time we had an outbreak where we had only had 800-odd people and 23 people in hospital, we've got five people in hospital with nearly double that figure. So... I know people are anxious. Moving from having lockdown and no cases on the island to opening up and learning to live with it was always going to be difficult and worrying for people. But at the end of the day, the damage to society, the damage to health of staying in permanent lockdown was worse than learning to live with it and putting mitigation in place. Uh, David, do you want to expand on that? Yeah, I think it was always going to be a bumpy path, to be honest, Rob. It was never going to be a smooth pathway to getting back to some form of normality. And as I said at this podium before, you know, people were going to be nervous, particularly when the borders changed, because that has you know, and first one to say it, it's always been our greatest protection. But as the chief minister's laid out there, in terms of lateral flow, in some ways it's been a victim of its own success in the fact that people are wanting the tests, people are wanting to take them. And I think that shows actually what a responsible society we are here in the Isle of Man, that people are wanting to test, they are wanting to find out if they are positive, they are not ignoring this virus and they're utilising what we've put on the table available. To emphasise again, the hospital's elect of surgery was cancelled because of general bed space um, nothing to do with covid at all if covid was not around and this situation occurred the same thing would have actually had to happen um, we've done it previously where we've had to unfortunately suspend elective surgery due to bed pressures at any particular time and also you know I, I think as we move forward we've got to you know what we've got to do is reassure people that it's not necessarily about the cases anymore it is about that hospitalization we have seen large numbers of case numbers. We said that we would. Um, we did say that we would expect that as we slowly started moving forward, the numbers would continue to rise. And that is exactly what they've done. But we're in a very, very different position to the one we were last year. It goes back to those two fundamental principles of why did we sacrifice so much last year? The two reasons we asked people to sacrifice so much last year was to stop the NHS becoming overwhelmed and allow for time for a vaccine programme to be developed so that we could vaccinate the most vulnerable vulnerable in our society. The vaccine has come online. We have done spectacularly here on Ireland with our rollout when you look at vaccination programmes around the world. And also we have, as a result of that, been able to protect our NHS. 
we've in previous waves of the virus we have had much lower number of cases and an awful lot higher number of hospitalizations so we are clearly seeing what the uk and other jurisdictions that have advanced in their vaccination program have seen which is that the vaccine is reducing quite substantially the risk of hospitalization i'm sorry minister i do just have to there's just a couple of things that you haven't covered there and i mentioned obviously how many workers are being forced into so, isolation sorry, sorry yes i I was going to come to that. Um, in terms of workers and isolation, um, I think we do need to look at the isolation rules and if there's anything we can do to assist around that. Um, and and I, have, I have my own views and I'm sure my other colleagues will as well have their own. Um, in terms of support for workers though, Rob, because you said about support, anyone who is isolating is able to claim incapacity benefit and they are able to do so from the very first day of isolation. So if you Treasury last year, I think it was, removed the restriction on the fact that you had to be off for three days before you could claim it. It went from it goes from day zero now. And I believe a press release, certainly I saw it just before I came in here, has gone out um, from Treasury actually announcing that there's going to be further support on top as well to help people. But yeah. there's also as well, the, the other thing that I mentioned, and again, sorry to interrupt, but obviously you will have noticed surely that the um, the covid cases dashboard this week there we've been inundated with comments from people about it being inaccurate and confusing you've mentioned there's been a lag in numbers how does how do you think this is acceptable in a way of communicating all that's going we, on to the we public? are providing a higher level of data than most other jurisdictions if you look at other jurisdictions websites they tend to provide high level data we've been breaking it down even down to where it's come from be it travel known source unknown source there's not many jurisdictions i can find around the world that go to that level of detail um, the the issue is and this has been an issue which we had very briefly in the january outbreak is the snapshots taken at 3 p.m. Now, the dashboard relies on 111 having input for that day all of the cases by the time the snapshot's taken. That hasn't been practical or able to be done. So that means cases have been being input after 3 p.m., which then the following day have not have not shown up on the case increase. That's why the boxes on slide one have now changed to cases added. Um, that was one particular issue of the way one box was calculated on slide one. The figures on slide two, which show the daily increased numbers, has always been correct. So if people are trying to loop back at how many cases there's been in previous days, they should always refer to slide two. The issue today looking at it appears to be that the link with Power BI has crashed. Um, and of course, you've got the IT people looking at that to see what they can do to restore the link. Okay, if I can I, just, just say, Rob, we're not trying to make out that this is a perfect situation here. Obviously, we have to react to problems as anyone does in, in their normal life. Obviously, we've got a team, they're doing their best. I think on the whole, if you look at it, they've done a very good job. But from time to time, things will go wrong or misinformation will get out there, which panics people. But so don't, please don't think we're, we're trying to claim that everything is perfect but I think the team are doing a very good job in the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Okay, and I just I do have one more question. I'm very conscious there are people um, coming after me here, but so you know, we you've talked about obviously li you know living with the virus, getting on with our lives, but there may be many people out there who are being isolated, who aren't actually getting any income, who probably don't really see it as living. They probably, you know, if anything, now more than ever with a rise in cases, rise in isolation, they could feel trapped in a cage, both physically and or financially. Is this really what living with the virus looks like these first few, these last few weeks? Well, I don't think you listened to an answer I gave earlier, Rob, where I said that the Treasury Minister was going to be making announcements on um, the ability to help people who have had to isolate through no fault of their own. So let's wait and see what he announces. I'm confident that people who are having to isolate from work and who won't get paid will be um, significantly, you know, happier with the offer that we are able to help with people. But it's, it's really something the Treasury Minister needs to announce and he will be doing it, it, it shortly. Um, businesses are, are struggling and, and I know it's, it's quite ironic. Some of the businesses that were demanding that we opened up um, 
when we opened up, have, have now seen some of their staff go down with, um, with COVID-19 and therefore they've had a staffing issue. So it's a case of you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. But we are moving into a phase, which we've announced for a while now, that we're having to learn to live with COVID in the community because of, the, I mean, we can do that because of the high percentage of the population that are vaccinated. Now, it's not perfect. You, we as a council of ministers have to look at a number of issues when we make these decisions. Obviously, medical, health, Health, but also financial, mental health, suicide, what's happening with businesses uh, and people unable to see family for over a year now. Some say they haven't seen family for two years. So we have to look at all these um, and take on board the overall situation. And we've all agreed, in fact, the whole of Tim will agreed that the time was now right to move forward with living with COVID and that we couldn't stay locked up forever. Some people I know would love us to have kept the border shut, allow no one to move on and off the island until it's all over. Well, it's not going to be all over. We've got It's going to be here for the rest of our lives and we've now got to learn to live with it. But I understand people's frustrations, people are anxious and we are doing our best. But with the vaccination programme, we feel that people are as well protected as we possibly can and learning to live with it is something we have to move on with. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. We now move on to Gemma Nettle from Isle of Man Newspapers. Good afternoon, Gemma. Faster Mai. Faster Mai, Chief Minister. Um, my question is in relation to if the government has calculated for this surge of cases we're experiencing. I know you said you knew cases would increase again. Um, is there any modelling of how big this wave of cases will be? And if so, will this be published? Do we know how many daily cases are projected at the peak? And when this is predicted right well i know i said from day one the minute we the minute we allowed people to come to the island have a pcr on day one and then um as long as they were positive as long as they were negative on that they could then uh, move around the island but would have to have a day six test the minute that happened we knew there was a risk there and sure enough someone came over back to the island was was negative and then was tested later as positive and had started the spread. So we, we knew that was going to happen. We knew that we were, if you follow the trajectory of, of the likes of Jersey, you can see that it has increased significantly there, you know, a lot more than we have. But I expect us to um, still see a significant increase in numbers before it goes down again. But David, would you like to comment on the rest of the question. Yeah, so I'll bring the Director of Public Health in in a moment. Um, we always knew that the case numbers were going to go up and there is models around doublings, um, which we've seen in the UK. It's also a model that has worked for the um, Jersey and the Channel Islands as well as to how many days before you see a doubling. Um, what matters, like I say, is not the case numbers now, it's the outcome of those cases. And as I say, if we compare it to previous waves, and that's very, very important, and the Chief Minister referred to earlier one of the waves, that when you look at the number of cases we had then, compared to the number of hospitalizations as a percentage of those cases, it was much, much higher. And so, so, so it's not so much about where does the peak come in terms of cases, it's actually around what is the outcome of those cases. And like I said, and this again feeds into the fact we're a very responsible island and we've got a lot of people doing lateral flows. Now, one of the things that comes off the back of that is we will identify a lot of cases that we otherwise wouldn't have known about. So, for instance, I know of quite a few people that are perfectly well, um, Nothing, they don't feel sick, they don't feel ill in any way, shape or form, completely asymptomatic. But out of curiosity, they did an LFT and they've come back positive. Now, in normal circumstances, we wouldn't have actually known about those people. And you may remember we did the antibody study um, where we did some antibody testing to work out how far COVID had gone in the first wave. And from that, we extrapolated that it was much more widespread than we first knew about. So as we get as a community test more we are going to naturally find more um, and so we will continue to see an increase of cases and being a small jurisdiction and a very responsible jurisdiction in terms of testing of people in the, with people in the community um, actually we will find a lot more cases per head of population than other larger jurisdictions that haven't got that level of community spirit and testing but I'll bring the director of public health in. 
Yes, not a lot to add there, really. It's been well covered by Chief Minister and the Minister. Picking up just on the issue of the mathematical modelling, um, as even the mathematical modellers themselves say, all models are wrong, but some may be useful. Um, for our situation as a small population, modelling is an incredibly inexact science. Models are based on multiple assumptions and small changes in one or more of those assumptions can make a huge difference to the predicted numbers. And in fact, one of the things that's been said um, by SAGE um, and other experts in the UK at the moment is that the modelling that's been done for this phase in their exit plan is acknowledged to be have much, much wider confidence intervals on it because there are more uncertainties now about how people are going to behave, um, what exactly is going to happen as lockdown has been released. So that reduces the utility of the modelling. And of course, in a small population where you've got transmission that doesn't follow a nice average you can have you know the black swan events the stochastic events that are totally unpredictable and can make a huge difference either in massively worsening the situation or indeed the reverse and making it better than you might have expected so for that reason we haven't pursued um, detailed modeling at this stage thank you Okay, thank you very much, Gemma, and thank you all very much for your questions. Thank you all for coming and listening today to the, the broadcast. I, I hope it's answered some of your questions. I appreciate some of you will be concerned. My heart goes out to the people that are in hospital and their families. I wish them all a speedy recovery. We are going through uncertain times as we move from uh, having full lockdown to having open society and living with COVID-19. We will get there in the end. I'm sure, with the vac success of the vaccination programme. But it is worrying times. I, I do understand people's concerns and, and, and angst. And we as a government are doing our best to improve the situation all the time. I hope you have a pleasant weekend and speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Lovely to see you, Auntie, even if it is over the internet. Yes, sorry I've not been able to come over. How's that nephew of mine? Geoffrey's fine. I'll just shout him. He looks lovely and peaceful there. Geoffrey, come and talk to Auntie. Not as quiet as I thought, dear. I don't know what we'd do without our Spectrum double glazing. For very effective double and triple glazing, visit spectrumwindows.im or the showroom Derby Road, Ramsey or call 8177